Catherine Jansen Burkett, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you. I am super excited to have this conversation. It was fun talking with you in the pre-interview, just getting to know you a little bit. And really in, in preparation, you know, the last couple of weeks for this podcast episode, as we've been um, corresponding and just trying to get a feel for you and your background, your expertise, I'm super excited to have a conversation today about living wakefully, you know, being our true authentic self and being in the moment. And then how does that connect with bridging differences to find true collaboration. We talk about collaboration all the time and we want organizations and teams that can collaborate, but what does that really mean and how does that connect back to being our true authentic self? Um, I think you, you have a lot to say on that. So I'm excited to have this conversation. As we get started today, I just wanted to share Catherine's bio with all the listeners. Catherine Jansen Burkett has a long had a passion for embodied wakefulness, wakefulness as a lived experience rather than simply a conceptual one. Her early professional life was a happy one as she enjoyed meaningful work in the field of public health. But over time, she felt an inner stirring and what was to ensue was the, a transition into her current work as a psychotherapist. For the past 15 years, she's guided others with personal and relational transformation as her clients discover their own path of embodied wakefulness. Now, Catherine is thrilled to build her work forward in her first book, River to Ocean, Living in the Flow of Wakefulness. She represents nine aspects, uh, she presents nine aspects of wakefulness within a framework of the inner and outer world. She not only offers powerful ideas, but ways to integrate each with an inspiring story from the field. Again, Catherine, a pleasure to have you on the podcast mm -hmm. today. Before we really launch into the conversation, anything else uh, that you'd like to share with listeners by way of your background, personal context, anything like that? Um, if we get into it, you know, um, I, you know, I came from some trauma in my childhood. So this topic is near and dear because um, in, a, in a certain kind of way, I had to fight for my wakefulness. I had to um, come out of a pretty deep abyss. And so I, for any of your listeners that, um, you know, have had personal struggles about the idea of bringing our, being happy and healthy and bringing our, our true self forward in our life. Um, for some of us, that's, that's quite a road to travel and, and an incredible one to experience from the dark night of the soul idea where we wouldn't have imagined we could have um, experienced life in that way and ourselves in that way and others particularly in certain ways. So I'm thrilled to be here. I'm so excited to talk about collaboration and bringing our authentic self to the table and that both can coexist um, because I think our world and our relationships these days so need this conversation. Yes, and and it's it's almost become a dirty word. It seems like in society, in at least Western and U.S. society these days, um, the talking about compromise and collaboration, and you know, uh, so many consider that to be uh, something where you're not being courageous enough because you're not sticking true to yourself, your your values, and you're compromising them, and you're you're working with other people, and maybe you have to sacrifice a piece of of who you are or what your idea is. And I think that's a tension that I see, you know, in, in thinking about mindfulness, wakefulness, and authenticity versus collaboration and compromise and working to develop relationships that yeah. that are healthy, that, that can have good outcomes, right? Um, so yeah. I think that's part of what we can explore together today. Um, yeah. And if you're willing and comfortable, I would love to hear a little bit about, you know, it doesn't need to be anything explicit, but, you know, in terms of the, the types of experiences, the trauma that you, you've you had, the dark night of the soul, as you, as you referred to it as, um, and then how you started to come out of that, because I think those types of um, examples are good lessons to all of us. I imagine many listeners have had their own traumas um, that take a, a wide variety of forms. And then I just think about, like, the this current context we're in right now we're in the middle of a pandemic and people are struggling emotionally um physically uh you know people are trying to do their best to juggle having kids at home and and yeah. doing work or maybe yeah. they've lost employment maybe they lo they've lost yeah. a loved one i just think there's so much trauma even built into this moment um exactly. that leaders need to figure out how to better um yeah. deal with and and to to help their people uh, and, and themselves to come out of this in a, in a healthy way. 
Yes. Um, in my earlier podcasting last year, we were talking a lot about preventing a mental health crisis, not just a public health crisis, um, be, but we did not know how long this would go. And so when people especially are under-resourced and we are all burnt out and frayed and it is fraught with me and we're not even done. Like we are looking at um, a chunk more time, though it's super hopeful that we can see the finish line. We're not at the finish line. Those are where our, you know, not our self at best, I would say, <laughs> maybe worse self um, can come forward. And not that we intend to do that, but that's the reality of stress um, is our resilience has been really um, stretched and capacity stretched. So I think this is very important to be intentional about and have ideas and practices, not just, I'm going to try to be a really good person today or really bring my A game to my work, but how do I actually do that? So that's a lot of the nature of my book is not just ideas, because there's a lot of great ideas. So I don't bring totally new ideas to the table, some perhaps, but I have a practice session, which is about building the neural pathways so that we actually can embody. So embodiment is about I'm living it, not I'm thinking about it or I'm aware of it. And then I, I do throw in inspirational stories from the field so that, um, you know, this is real. People are really doing this. And some of my story is in it, but it's not a memoir. So lots of other people's stories, clients, some of my kids, friends. So with obviously permission. Um, so I'll just, yeah, tell a piece, you know, my parents divorced in a kind of traumatic way for me. And so my little 14 year old self took it really hard and it really fractured a sense that I wasn't good enough to keep my dad and our family. He took off, it was really about alcoholism, but we didn't know it at the time. And so what turned into, what was trauma turned into food addiction and, uh, you know, uh, like gaining 80 pounds in about three months. Um, I was unrecognizable to my high school friends. I quit high school. Like it was on all levels that it was very dark for me. I attempted suicide. So I really had to heal from that sense of my worth, my body. I had to figure out, okay, I'm not going to finish high school. I got a GED. What's next? I actually moved to San Francisco from a small town in Oregon. So again, it was really climbing out. And that's why my book is about the inner world before the outer world, because I strongly believe that's where change, true change um, starts and, and stays. And we bring those changes and transformations and healings to our outer world. So I don't even think of my work as separate from any other part of my outer world life. My authentic self, I want to be expressed in all those places. So that's a trauma piece and kind of an idea about the book and maybe part of the conversation we're having. But if you want me to, I can respond to the how do we match authentic self with our ideas in this culture about collaboration, which does tend to seem like compromise. So I'm losing a part of myself so they don't right, fit right. together very well. Um, I guess the key word I would use is ego. So to me, our awakened self is different than an ego self where I feel separate from others and I always am um, kind of tracking am I better or, or less than. It's competitive. Ego state kind of comes from a place of scarcity. So my book proposes that our awakened state is intrinsically worthy, interconnected, that I'm part of something bigger, but I don't get into a lot of spiritual language there, whatever that looks like for people. So, and it's relaxed. You know, I I don't have to perform in my life. I don't have to prove anything. So I'm in this state of kind of connection, relaxation. Um, so that's kind of in present in the moment. So that's kind of how I define an awakened self. So to me, when I think about collaborating, and I never use the word compromise because it does have this reputation of lost. Um, Part of, part of collaboration is I'm not coming in with my ego. Egos are about power. Egos are about position. And if we're actually going to collaborate, we do need to be willing um, to look at alternatives and options um, and have a, a kind of a guiding principle that going together in a win-win um, possibility is better than if I get my way. So Jonathan, if, if at the end of the day, you just want to get your way. That's kind of, I would offer, and I don't obviously mean that about you personally, but that's kind of more of an ego approach to it. 
But if I believe that it will be better, even for me, if we find um, some path forward that again, but works for both of us. So the bottom line is collaboration takes creativity. It takes time. It takes a willingness to sometimes not know what the outcome is and get out of our position. So a really practical step that I use, and I to, had to use this a lot with couples because I was their therapist, both people. So I couldn't take a side. That's unethical. And so I would say, what is the common ground? I could see it literally between them, but they were so positioned up they couldn't see where they could meet. So I have a tool around collaboration, which is to start with a perspective, not a position. And then we move into, okay, you don't want a dog. I do want a dog. What's our common ground? You don't want a dog because you want to make sure you can still travel once we can travel again. Actually, I kind of resonate with that. I still want to be able to travel. Um, I want a dog because I really, you know, having a pet is really comforting. And once in a while, you actually miss having a dog, even though you kind of still would rather not have one. So we start to move toward where there is some commonality. And then the next piece, and it's so cool, is to see sometimes there are options that when we get out of our position, we never would have seen. Maybe we foster dogs and it's once in a while. Maybe we budget for just having a really good boarding situation where we travel as, as often as we want and that dog is not an encumbrance to that. So it's about finding common ground, it's about exploring options, and it's about bringing our awakened self actually to the table that allows us to collaborate rather than be in an ego positioning kind of, you know, place. So I know that was a lot. <laughs> no, I think that's great. And I, it, it's smart to, to avoid getting caught in the trap of compromise, the terminology and the baggage associated with that word. And it's so unfortunate. I mean, the, the reality is, yes, we all are are going about comp compromises, some big, some small, constantly, right? In all of our relationships. But that doesn't mean we need to sacrifice ourself or our authentic self. It does mean we get outside of the ego, like you just said. So I, I think that's wonderful. Now I'm, I'm putting on the, the hat of an organizational leader right now. And I'm thinking both as... A, as myself, you know, my trying to bring my own authentic self to my own leadership approach and style, but also trying to create the same opportunity for my people, the people that report to me, uh, and wanting to have collaborative teams, uh, innovative teams. We know that that happens when people feel safe, when they feel like they can be their full authentic self, and then bring that and have it honored in the workplace and as they work together in teams. Um, yet, collaboration and effective collaboration is this elusive thing that frankly, most organizations don't do very well. So I, I'm curious if, if you have any particular thoughts or, or um, ideas on, on how a leader can foster a workplace environment where people can be authentic, but also be better collaborators. Well, that's such a good question, Jonathan. And what's coming to share to mind to share is um, and I do group work through the retreats I do, and I have ongoing groups also all the time. So the sense of safety, and that actually is a human thing. So it goes everywhere. There's no environment where um, that human dynamic um, isn't important and operating. So people either feel safe or they don't feel safe. So that actually has to do with the culture and, and even some of the communication practices. So if I'm leading an organization, I want to have real clear guidelines and supports to help people because they might not have learned this in their childhood and they might not know what ground rules are, what I statements are, what actually creates a sense of safety. Again, it's a nice idea, but even in this conversation, Jonathan, do you feel safe with me? Do I feel safe with you? Our human system, our nervous system is tracking that. And so safety is one piece, but I would add another, and that is about relationship. Because if we care about the other person, we two things happen. We Our guard comes down. So those can be named as kind of relational defenses. So then I am going to be able to be more my authentic self when I don't have masks and armor. But also, if I care about you, if I know you, then that human process of bonding to others starts to kick in. And so I have a motivation to, to collaborate rather than it's because we have that on our mission statement. It's actually because I care about my team. 
And I don't want to win because then there's somebody loses and that's not the end game anymore. Um, and so there's a safety and relationship, I think are very, very real things that, um, you know, and I think organizations are, uh, many of them kind of getting some of those pieces compared to, you know, long ago where it was so task oriented and a lot less relationship oriented. Sorry, I lost my cursor there for a moment. I wanted yes, to mute okay. myself. Um, yeah, absolutely. I And to your point, organizations as a general rule, <laughs> I think have come a long way and are better at this than they yeah. were decades yeah. ago, right? But there's yeah. still so much more to do. And there's so much research on this. So I think we're even past the point of saying like, this is debatable or like there's, mm -hmm. we're still trying to figure out what, how to do this. Like we know how to do it. Um, and I think most leaders who are worth their salt, you know, anyone who actually has training and skill as a leader, they know, at least in principle, how to do it, putting it like taking the conceptual understanding and putting it and implementing it into practice, though, I think is a different thing. And the best well-meaning people still really struggle with how to do this on a regular basis. And I, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on why that is. Uh, and how we can disrupt kind of the, like we put up our own barriers um, exactly. that, that, that halt our ability to do it, even if we know what we need to be doing. That's right. That's so wise to say, you know, we can't transcend what we haven't, I would say, built in our brain. <laughs> and I, I think at the end of the day, a lot of this is neural, neurological. Um, and so, yes, you can tell, you can create the environment for me, but if I, and going back to actually trauma, going back to a culture that is very ego-based and ego-driven Western culture, it is very hard for me to actually embody this and do this and work through those defenses that actually we don't want to um, demonize defenses because they are there for a reason. And especially for those of us that had trauma, um, they, they were our protectors. The thing is, if you don't do some deeper work in your life and you can call it, you can go to a therapist, which is really best because then you have a person helping you see your blind spot. You can read books, you can do, you know, retreats, but if you don't make it personal, then you may not know where you're um, still caught in some of that trauma and some of the um, coping strategies from trauma, which are to build defenses and armor. And so as those actually begin to heal, then um, even though we have to kind of work with them over our lifetime, at least I know they're there, I know what they look like, I know how they operate. Then in my work environment, I have much more of a chance um, of, um, like you say, uh, integrating the, those ideals as a leader or as a team member or as an employee. So not that everybody that one hires needs a psych eval or you need to make sure they've done 10 counseling sessions um, but I do think kind of an emotional intelligence piece is important um, and, and moving into not just doing uh, personality tests, which are common now and like, okay, we have to match working styles, but actually even a deeper dive into where is this person um, might maybe going to struggle with the very things we want to manifest in this organization. And this stuff takes time and investment. And sometimes that's the reality, even as a parent, like if you don't want to be you know, um, old school with your kids. I didn't want to spank. I didn't want to yell at my kids, right? But it took more time to actually get in there and figure some stuff out. It takes more time for couples to be um, collaborative. Why don't we just have one person acquiescing? It's just, it saves time, saves, well, there's a, a consequence to that. So I guess the, it's an investment in time might be part of the answer too, of why do people or organizations, even if they know better, have a hard time choosing into this. So there's kind of the, at the collective level and maybe also a piece at the individual level. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, it does. And I, I can, it really resonates with me what you were just describing. And certainly we have the defensive pieces that sometimes we're not even aware of mm -hmm. <laughs> that are, that are dictating exactly. so much of what we do. Um, yeah. But then we also have just the daily grind. Like I think of most leaders that find themselves in positions uh, of authority they're, they're, they, they carry a great burden. They have a weight on their shoulders and they're, you know, I, I, I believe that most leaders are trying to do the best they know how, um, mm -hmm. that they want to do right by their people. Not always, but I think most are trying. Um, but, but 
they have a lot on their plate and they're, they're trying to put out fires and they're trying to help the organization stay afloat and meet the needs of their people. And I think even the most well-intentioned people, when you find yourself in that kind of a daily grind, the natural inclination is to start cutting corners when it comes to relationship building and these team dynamics, because because it does take consistent, sustainable effort over time. Like every day, you can't shortcut it. Um, mm -hmm. And if you do, it has consequences, as you just referred to. And ultimately, you know the, that that culture of safety won't be there. That that feeling mm -hmm. of authentic um, caring won't be there. And even if you do care, even if you do want a safe environment, even if you do value your people, if as a leader, I'm not doing those consistent things every day, then it's like I'm, it's not, it's like, I don't care about it. Yeah. Um, Cause ultimately it, that's um, the experience of your people. Exactly. And that's certainly where morale could be compromised. Like, oh, we say this, but my lived experience in this organization actually in the, in the felt way is different. But it is a c consistent commitment to it. But one of the things I always like to promote is if we do good work, the work lessens over time. There's a maintenance piece, but it's not all like there's there's a creating it. Um, and so I haven't even like this stuff kind of framed as the word work because that tends to have a negative context. What else? It's a lot of work not to do the work. Like you say, if you cut corners, there's a wake behind that and we can't be disassociated from that and in denial of that. You know, it's like if I ate three brownies today, I can do that, but I'm going to probably have a stomach ache, you know? And so we just need to bring honesty to the table as leaders, as human beings. I think there's a big piece, like you say, the grind. When I hear that word, Jonathan, people need to take care of themselves. And I think our culture both can be so egocentric and ego driven and individualistic um, in a way that's not helpful. I and mean, it's actually, I believe, somewhat toxic. But also that we've demonized, if we do do self-care, we're narcissists or we're selfish. And, you know, somehow there's a North Star in martyrdom. And so if I'm feeling a grind, if I am not able to bring a full cup to the table as a leader to manifest and to um, kind of, uh, I don't know, reflect myself, those very things, principles that I'm trying to impart, then I need to have a chat with myself, I think, about, you know, in leadership, it is about deep self-care um, because of what's required. So, so that then the things that I intend to do are the actual experience of um, my organization and its employees. Yeah, I agree. And I, I struggle with that myself. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I'm busy. I, I have a lot of stuff with work. I have a family. I have six children. Like, Anytime I need to do anything in relation to self care, I, my first inclination is to feel self like selfish um, that I'm taking that time, and I know that that's silly. Like I know in my head that I need to do it, but then I also feel like anything that I I put into my own care means I'm taking away from my wife or my kids, and and so there's this um, tension. And I know I'm not the only one that feels that. I, I think a lot of people do, and you just have to work through it and learn, you know, that it's, it's like putting the mask on first when you're in an airplane, you know, putting on the oxygen mask, you just, mm -hmm. you won't be in a place to, to help those you love unless you take care of yourself first. Well, exactly. And I'm, I'm really visual. So I always think of like, you got to fill your bucket because the consequence of not doing it, so let's look at the shadow of that. And this could be an organization, this could be in a family dynamic, it shows up everywhere, is I resent, and I can't transcend that resentment if I, if I abandon myself enough over time. That even though no one asked me to do that, I have six kids too, by the way, they never asked me to do that. But if I do that, then I will resent them. And that is, that is not only over time I have less and less to give because I'm burnt out and I'm, I'm straight at the bottom of the bucket, but then there's this not great dynamic. So what would generosity to self then translate to generosity to others? It tends to. The more I give to myself, the more I actually have to offer. And guess what? I'm not resentful. I'm super friendly. Does that mean I do everything for everybody all the time? No, it means I practice boundaries. It means I really do walk the walk of I'm not going to be able to do that now, maybe later. Maybe I can help you find it, figure something different out. 
But as I practice self-care, again, I am nourished, I am nurtured. And so I tend to have more energy, more product productivity, more creativity. Um, all the things that we want to bring to parenting, to our work relationships, to our projects. So again, so you're, you're speaking to why my second aspect of my book was freedom from the mind, because the mind and thought, first of all, there's research that says most of our thoughts are untrue or have some level of inaccuracy, but we act as if every thought we think is truth serum. And so in that chapter, so the first uh, aspect is about befriending self, befriending me. So it's having this idea of having a relationship to oneself that is not shameful, and it includes intrinsic worth and self-love, that kind of thing, and, tra and trauma work. But the very next thing we have to do is deal with the mind and this brain that's going to tell us, oh, I'm Jonathan, I really wanted to take a nap today, or I really wanted to see a friend this weekend, but the kids have all this soccer stuff, or all these deep different things are going on, that's selfish. You would need to have a, a practice, a way to, to address that and confront that. Is that true, that that's selfish? And so challenging our thoughts, because thoughts become stories, and stories become choices of behavior, because I believe that. And then if I have a way to challenge that thought, it's like, oh, actually, that's not true. It becomes more selfish not to take care of myself because you know what? I'll resent people. I won't be available as you know easily. I won't have as much to offer six months from now. That's actually more selfish. So starting to play with thought um, is just a powerful thing, you know, because that's a huge part of most of our existence. Yeah, and a lot of what I hear you saying in my mind, translates back to short-term versus long-term orientation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And if, if whether it's in my personal life or as a leader in an organization, uh, I mean, to your point earlier, cutting corners in the sh short term saves you time and effort. In the long run, it causes way more problems <laughs> and it creates way more work for you. And like 90% of the fires that you spend each day putting, you know, you spend the majority of your time putting out fires every day. 90% of those are of your own making because you were cutting corners before and you created all this extra work down the line. And so, and the same thing in your personal life, like short-term um, orientation almost always ends up leading to longer-term challenges and issues. But if you can shift and have a long-term orientation, whether it's in my personal life, whether it's with my people at work, trying to to foster a safe environment and collaborations and not not short circuiting things by cutting corners in the short run. Um, in the long run, you have a, a more sustainable approach and you have a way that um, will actually benefit everybody much better. Uh, but it takes the consistency, it takes, it takes that recognition and we need to short circuit when our brain starts to push us towards those shortcuts or push us towards those short term types of um, uh, sacrifices that actually yeah. in, in aren't, they're, they're not helpful. Yeah. Exactly. And I think, you know, the indigenous idea of any decision I make, how will that affect seven generations down? You know, that feels like so bizarre now to people of your generation. I might be older, my generation, like seven generations. We're trying to make sure everything's okay. Two generations, like that kind of way of being the wisdom of that. Just like, you know, living from more of a sense of the collective. My goodness, do we understand now we are on one planet. We are in a, a different kind of global reality on any front than used to be. So we cannot be isolated. And we need to have our thinking, like you say, long-term and in a bigger context. But you know, that idea, that old-fashioned idea of delaying gratification is like, you know, if we can, I'm in a 30-year marriage. My parents divorced. I can't believe I'm in a 30-year marriage. I never would have, I didn't believe it could even, and, and happily, not perfectly, and not without, you know, some pretty difficult kind of dark nights of the soul a few times along the way. Of what are we doing? And how do we bring a more conscious relationship forward? But if we can, you know, to take that long view, to, we can relax. We can take a breath. It doesn't mean we're inactive. It's not about sitting around eating bonbons. But for our nervous system, that is so different to go just, we had some time and some things need time and we've forgotten. 
you know, now they even have, I'm not single, but they have speed dating. It's like, oh, right. In 30 seconds, you're going to decide, you know, or two dates, you're going to decide, guess what? Falling in love for some of us took a little bit, but that's not what the fairy tale tells us, right? And so I, I think this whole pace and speed, I, I love the point you make around that. And I love that perspective. I, and I, we're about ready to finish, but I can't help to digress just a little bit based on the speed dating comment. Um, I am so glad that I did not grow up in the generation that used Tinder um, and like the swipe left, swipe right kind of immediate immediacy of I, that kind of stuff seems so it, it's beyond my comprehension. <laughs> so I'm, I'm glad that I I'm did. I'm so happy. I'm so happy. Yes. <laughs> yes. And I, it's nice to have that message of long-term on, again, I think we've done a great job in this interview too. So many of these things for me are not contextualized to this part of life or that part of life. There is a deep, that's why it's, it's wakefulness throughout all of those environments and all of those kinds of relationships. And so um, anyway, I, I'm really glad that it, um, you were able to do that and we didn't just have to stick on with a work environment. Um, and so I, I hope your listeners are able to capture some of those, those consistent themes, um, however they apply it in their life. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure talking with you today. Before we close, I do want to give you a chance to give the last word uh, to share with listeners how they can get connected with you and find out more about your book and what you're up to um, and, and just uh, anything you want to say as we wrap up. Oh, well, thank you. Yes. Um, I love River to Ocean because um, it, you know, it's the book I use actually as just kind of a guidebook. Um, there's different parts of life I represent. I even have a chapter on embracing death and dying. I have one on relationship to nature, um, cherishing the body. So where if this kind of thing we're speaking of resonates for people, I'd encourage them to get the book. It's an audible as well now. Um, we did that last year. Great narrator, not me. So that is found um, at my website. Um, I can be reached where I have a blog and I can send a personalized book. Um, so it's harborglowholistic.com. Um, and so that has my publishing company, my counseling um, and retreat work. And then just to get the book, if you want to go to Amazon or Barnes and Noble or some of the other outlets, it's also available there. So, yeah. Wonderful. Well, Catherine, yeah. it has been a real pleasure. Uh, I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected, uh, check out the book and find out more about what Catherine uh, can do for you and, and to help you in, in your personal life and your, in your work life. Um, and as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week.